introduce our, our featured speaker for today. Uh, we have Ashley Axios, who was on stage at our AGL Summit in um, Washington, D.C. She is a um, former Obama administration high-ranking official that worked in the White House and has a, a really great uh, history uh, serving uh, the public sector. And uh, we're really honored to have her here today to chat, ask some questions. So we'll go through a, a few questions uh, at the top of this meeting, and then we'll open it up uh, later on for uh, the group to ask your questions. So think of your questions now, and uh, welcome. Welcome, Ashley. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Well, uh, you were on stage in Washington, D.C., as I mentioned. And by the way, that that video uh, recording is on our website. So uh, check it out on our blog. Uh, It was a a great presentation. So um, I guess my first question is, um, you you know, just tell us about yourself. Uh, We know you have a a background working in government, but you're now in the private sector. Maybe we could just start, uh, you know, at your service or even before that. Tell us about you. Sure. So I'm a designer uh, by trade and found my way um, into the government space um, through a kind of roundabout way. I think my my peers in art school um, and in subsequent years are like, what is she doing? Always going after uh, cause based projects and works, working with nonprofits, startups, digital agencies, uh, went in house at a nonprofit. Um, really built up experience across digital, different types of design that focus on making an impact where it's really the most valuable, which is what brought me to the DC area. Um, and through volunteering through a design organization that I became a, a part of, um, I learned about the space to make an impact in government. So I joined the board of AIGA DC, which is a local chapter in the DC area for the Professional Association for Design which I'm now on the national board uh, for and that incoming president for, but it's a really large, it's the largest and oldest actually design um, association and it's got 75 chapters and the DC chapter is one of them. But through volunteering at a um, happy hour for the local DC chapter, I met the former White House creative director and he wasn't looking for anybody at the time and I wasn't looking for a job, but um, you know, just those kind of networking and the connections worked out later that, um, you know, he shared when they were looking for an art director. And the more I talked to him, the more I realized the opportunity to make an impact in the government space um, across so many of the issues that I cared about that I, you know, was otherwise working one at a time with a nonprofit or something like that on. Um, and so I, I gave it a shot and I went in-house um, in the White House as a art director in 2012 um, and ended up staying. I got promoted along the way um, uh, as a creative director and, and left in 2016. Uh, and I was a political appointee, so we had a we had an out <laughs> um, at a specific time anyways, just based on how my role was set up. Um, but it was pretty incredible because I worked out of the Office of Digital Strategy, which is kind of the first of its kind within the U.S. government and got to see and be a part of uh, starting so many of the other groups that ended up coming a little bit later in, you know, 2013, 14, 15, um, from, you know, CFPB, uh, USDS, 18F, um, uh, PIFS programs that uh, really kind of grew uh, and evolved some of the work that we're doing in-house for the White House. Um, Now, since I'll share that, uh, you know, I went on and uh, when I left, I worked at Automatic, which is tech company behind WordPress.com and um, started their uh, kind of creative studio and their fully distributed company, uh, which was a really great break from government after being on site at the, at the White House for very long hours. Um, and then I'm currently chief experience officer and partner at Ann Partners. I just got drawn back into working where it really matters within the government space. And so we create ethical products and service design solutions using human-centered design, um, research and technology approach. And we're growing and evolving and it's my first time on the other side of the the government relationship that's still working on many of the same issues. Interesting, well, fascinating. I'd like to come back to your, what you're doing currently, but before that, you just mentioned uh, the Office of Digital 
um, digital strategy. Is that mm -hmm. what you, That's is right. that yeah. what it was called? So um, I was wondering if you could talk more about that office. Does it still exist? And, you know, what's the main function behind it? So um, during our administration, it was, uh, I still say R, to stake some claim into it, but uh, <laughs> um, the mission is kind of connecting people with purpose, or in other words, kind of using um, the impact of technology on how people get information, engage with one another and act um, to create kind of a two-way dialogue and um, um, enable action between the uh, administration and the public. And, you know, that's still pretty broad, uh, which was an incredible opportunity. We, I can share later if, if it makes sense, but we're able to do a whole lot um, with that mandate and scope. And we're really just a small team. Uh, I wasn't there at the very beginning, but uh, it maintained around 20 people total uh, in the time that I was part of it. Uh, and that included developers, writers, our social media team, videographers, uh, who had the best job following the president and, and vice president around and first lady documenting things so that we could put them out um, and really create that connection. But I think to your other question, None of that really exists in the same way today. It's, um, as I understand it, pretty different. Uh, there's, I believe, some contracting for designs for some other services, but it's not, uh, it's not as integrated. We did everything from the site to major campaigns. I can, I'm happy to talk more about it well, if you want. Please to. do. Actually, <laughs> I was going to ask you. Yeah, just to get at least one example of one of the projects you did. This sounds really fascinating. Well, I, I hate to give just one because it is such a broad, but I'll maybe I'll fly through a couple or okay. a few um, to give you a set. Uh, but um, one that folks like to reference because it was more iconic and in some ways actually pretty simple is just the Rainbow White House in celebration of the Supreme Court decision legalizing same-sex marriage. And then um, one that nobody knows about to kind of contrast that, it happens in the background is um, design and digital support for the Iran nuclear deal negotiations and then the, um, the Iran nuclear deal itself. We put together White House Student Film Festival, um, designed the first kind of We the People platform, this petitions platform to enable people to um, interact with and have a chance for, for real um, policy change and conversation with the government on issues that matter to them. And then like tax calculators and open sourcing um, budget data on GitHub and infographics and um, even video and jokes for the correspondence dinner, really humanizing and connecting the brand of the president and the brand of the White House with the American people. Because you all get tired of, uh, I think especially now, but you all get tired of a uh, um, seeing somebody in such a high position of power just behind a podium and delivering remarks from like a teleprompter. Sure, sure. Well, so thank you. No, that's really, really good uh, set of examples. Um, now, um, in terms of, you know, those are obviously success stories. And I want to focus on success because I know that there are a number of things that came out of that office and that administration really uh, you know, with successes, you know, also come challenges. And I was wondering if you could talk about the two, you know, uh, together success stories, but also the challenges that you had to overcome. Yeah, I think some of, I could kind of bucket things, you know, not superficially, but um, into some different categories. And I'm sure not all of these will be a surprise to you, but I'll start with one of the more obvious ones, which is kind of the political side. Um, a big challenge for us in getting work done was really um, a lack of like congressional support. Sometimes that came down to funding, which I know um, many of our partners and agencies experience every day. You have ambitions, you want to grow, you're doing these agile development, you plan to have a little bit more investment over time, but if that budget gets stripped in half, there goes those plans. So we had that on the technical side, but we also had that um, on the subject matter and substance of the work that we were doing um, aside from the implementation. So, you know, issues we were pushing on like immigration reform, closing gun loopholes, like building on ACA or Obamacare versus just continually defending it, um, even getting like a sensible uh, Supreme Court, you know, judge into consideration <laughs> to be on the bench. 
those are all like I mean, just major political hurdles that would um, just continually kind of trip us up and make it really difficult to um, get things done. Um, there are also, I think what you're referring to too, Bill, is like this kind of general bureaucracy and red tape. Um, and of course, we're the first to do quite a few things. Um, and so I feel like I have to volunteer the kind of caveat that, you know, while we had challenges here and I can outline what some of them were, we, I also kind of recognize that working from the White House and the executive office of the president meant that like we were, we had a lot more leeway than many other agencies and folks that are working on in government actually get. It was a little bit easier for us to kind of knock on the right door <laughs> um, uh, in certain situations. But that still, like to give you a sense of how far things came, when we first got in office, the White House didn't even have read access to social media. So if you can imagine the press office not even being able to read what's happening on Twitter, you know, that's a huge blocker. How are we going to innovate and really connect people with purpose to the mission of our team if we're not, not even able to see it? Um, and, you know, you can be mad at us for that one now because it seems to have swung uh, a little bit. Um, but also just kind of, you know, we push to things like having social media, live influencer interviews, again, like open sourcing it seems really simple, right? But open sourcing budget code, budget data, those numbers to allow people to make their own visualizations and to see what's happening with their tax dollars and how much is going to each of these different areas. If it hadn't been done before, there's a lot of fear around what was going to happen, what people would make of that. You know, are other people gonna start to develop their own policy proposals now? Cause we've given them this power and a new kind of insight. And so there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, including just like building tools, just cutting through red tape. Um, and, and the way we got most of our progress done is by slowly building on it and making small uh, precedent as time went on that we could reference back to take another small step forward. And then I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't call out like a bucket around just kind of uh, social and personal challenges. <laughs> Cause that's like, especially while I was in office was least likely to talk about, but you know, when you're really close to so many issues, working on them day in and day out, and you're feeling all the things that are happening around the country, things like, you know, gun terrorism and climate um, and natural disasters just hit so much harder, but you have to push through it and we're working incredibly long hours. So, you know, I feel so personally, I could tell you the moment, you know, we found out that Gabby Giffords got shot or Sandy Hook Elementary School, um, Michael Brown, and I'm sure many other Americans do too, but being in a position where you're daily working on these issue areas and responding and changing your plans for how you're communicating with the public based on the things that are happening in the moment, you know, we'd have a lot pent up and I'd go home for Thanksgiving and like, just let it all out because <laughs> I need to actually deal with the fact that we're working on such heavy topics. So that's not something that we talk about all the time, but I'd say that's like just a, a huge challenge to working in an area like that. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, so your current role, you're, you're consulting, uh, you're, you're partnering with, uh, with the government, with the federal government and other government agencies. Uh, I was curious how your your background and experience uh, factors into that, considering uh, these different roles that you've played and, and the exposure to uh, some of these topics. Uh, what How does that play out in your current position? Um, so I would say the biggest one is that like, m like my greatest strength, the thing kind of pulling through my, my work is not actually very special or unique to me, but it's just grit, <laughs> um, something a lot of other folks have. Um, but it's enabled me to kind of do, to fully utilize like a human centered design approach in the work that I do. That is like really looking closely at the, the problems that are now and being able to keep my eyes open um, when it's hard, right? What's wrong? Why? How can we fix it? Who's left out? How can we better serve them? And like you, and utilizing those processes that as designers, we, we come into as kind of muscle memory. And it, I know this happens with a lot of folks using agile process as well, but you know, envisioning 
uh, going from listening to envisioning, hypothesizing, prototyping, failing, trying again until we get something as a collective and push further and further towards a future and better state. And because it has so many sprints and cycles to it, and it's not like a one and done type of solution, it requires a good amount of persistence um, to get uh, to some real change. So I, I like to say kind of looking at the, what I want folks to do is kind of look at the present as a realist um, and then the future as an idealist and have the grit to move from like point A to point B, um, from this like really realist, what, where are we now to, you know, that better future. And really without all the sparkly things people think of as design, that is design. So with that, like, you know, use that and taught that um, working in the White House with policy folks and with others, just kind of um, teaching about these approaches that we kind of call design approaches, but I now get to build that into uh, our company into and partners, build that practice with our clients and, and relate to them because many of them are, you know, government clients. And so they're dealing with some of the same types of things that I dealt with in the past. And so we can relate and use that as a, um, you know, a way for us to coach and help them through things. Um, and that makes it sound less fun than it is, but because the future is so much more positive and optimistic and we're working together and it's not a solo kind of endeavor, it actually ends up being, I think, just really fun and invigorating and you can kind of keep going through those painful cycles. So uh, you were just talking about working with the, your, your government clients and having, having been there, having served uh, in government. Um, not that um, you don't strike me as the kind of person who would give unsolicited advice or tell someone how to do their job just because you were there. Yeah. However, I'm going to ask you, what, what's your advice for people who work in government? You know, what, what would you, uh, having been there uh, and, and now being, uh, looking at it from a di different perspective, what advice generally do you have for people serving in government? To find their, their allies, you don't need to be like, you know, you don't need to know everybody in every office and every department, but if you can find like the one person that you can connect with pretty closely who kind of gets it, gets what you're trying to achieve, communicate it well in the um, kind of stakeholder groups that make up, you know, the work that you're trying to get done, then you can pretty much get everything done, right? Because they can navigate their office. Um, they can help advocate for you in those spaces. Um, and I think I was able to run really the fastest when establishing those types of internal relationships, which is a whole other kind of design problem, right? It's this like um, organizational design piece. Um, and then I think there's like a, um, I mean, it almost feels like, a, it's, all of this feels kind of like relationship advice, right? It's for like hard skills, soft skills meet, but, um, you know, I think of those like those weird uh, advice, r romance advice columns, and they talk about like love banks, and they're like, you take money out, you got to put money back in your love bank, you can't just keep spending from it. And I think we don't really do that with our stakeholders internally, but it's especially important in government where people are getting really burnt out. So I, you know, put a lot of pressure on our chief of staff at one point in time in the White House. Um, because we needed to go responsive and they didn't see the value of it. And I kept coming back around and finally convinced. And it's tempting because there's so many things on your plate to just run away from that afterwards. You've gotten it done, move on to the next thing, and then just bug that person again when you need them. But I learned you're not going to get that same investment or approval or the thumbs up, even if you did the thing really well, if you don't come back and credit them. <laughs> if you don't put the, the thanks and the love kind of back into the bank. So especially if you've got folks who are those major champions and have helped you um, get a little bit more favor and work done, it's, it's really important to kind of um, invest back in them, give away as much of the credit as possible, make sure others know that they played a role in a successful project. Um, so that you have that chance again, you can keep building on it. Um, I think those are some of some of the big ones. And uh, this is kind of a design, a, a smaller designer communications note, but 
just continually try to use other people's language as well. Um, adopting the language of the group that you're talking to, I think also makes all the difference. Um, not going to get anywhere by talking about code to, <laughs> you know, somebody with a marketing background who is in a chief of staff role, right? So um, spending some time listening and then channeling the communications to the audience, um, you know, that's how we got a lot of the work done that we needed to. And it starts before you even get the, the okay. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, shifting gears uh, just a little bit. And um, so we're gonna go to the group for questions in just a second, so uh, folks get ready. But um, I wanted to ask you, uh, this is one of our sort of standard interview questions. Uh, what's on your reading list? Um, who, who do you follow You know, that are your favorite authors? And, and uh, I was wondering if you could share your uh, insight. Yeah, so I'm... Um, I've got my reading goals that I'm, I try to achieve every year. And so I think some of my favorites recently have been um, well, Bad Blood by John Carew. Um, it's about Theranos. Um, so that's a really, I think, critical read if you're anywhere in the intersection of technology, like business and ethics, which everybody should, I guess, be in the ethics bucket. Um, but it's just also an incredibly well told story about like the failure of this, this startup, this company. Um, I also really enjoyed the fifth, uh, the fifth risk by um, Michael Lewis, which is a semi, you know, political, but it's about the uh, 2017, 2016, 2017, uh, presidential transition and, and specifically like the challenges of the transition within federal agencies and areas that, that folks don't always think about, at least the public, many of you might, right? But like people think that energy is just about green energy versus coal or whatever's in the, in the media, but much of the work of the Department of Energy is actually maintaining um, storage for nuclear power and our electric grid and you know, if that doesn't get the right investment or people aren't onboarded right, like there's this immense opportunity for failure. So that stuff is just, I know it's really fascinating. It's another one that's just well-written. Um, and I'm a dork for true crime, which um, don't, ask, don't ask me why, but uh, uh, True Story by Michael Finkel was uh, really uh, just quick and, um, fascinating read about uh, somebody who was accused of killing a couple people, left the country, and then picked up and just went by the identity of a journalist. And then the journalist found out and had been fired, and they actually start a friendship of sorts, a relationship um, where the journalist is trying to learn why this person chose him as his like identity when he tried to run away. Um, so what else I say? Um, I, I think I've recommended this at the AGL summit as well, but Technically Wrong by Sarah Watcher Botcher is another really good one. It's just all of the ways tech can go wrong. And specifically, it's a lot about like algorithms and, you know, the more indirect um, kind of relationship that code can have on, on people's lives. Um, so those are a few of my... My books. What was the other part? It's just on. Well, um, so um, authors, books, uh, and then just, you know, any analysts that you follow, who are the, the thought leaders, I suppose, is a, a better way to put it. You know, those who um, you really pay attention to their tweets or, or whatever it is that you're following. Yeah. Um, another kind of long list, but I'd say my, some top ones are Anil Dash, the work that he's doing with Glitch is, is um, just really great as far as community, product, design, and um, he's really thoughtful about ethics, both in how he set up his, biz his business as well as um, the technology, and he's open about talking through um, his philosophy and um, how, they're, how that's progressing. Um, and then Chansey Fleet, I follow on Twitter. Um, she works at the New York Public Library and is a blind uh, woman 
who's challenging the way that tech is designed and built. Um, and she does a lot of advising directly and um, disability advocacy, but is really deep in the tech community, which we don't always see because it's difficult enough as a, as a user of technology if you're blind, um, but as somebody who's actively participating in building it, it feels like it's nearly impossible. Um, and then uh, Maurice Cherry, who's out of Atlanta, has a podcast that's been running for, for quite a while called Revision Path. And um, it highlights hundreds of black uh, designers, developers, and digital creatives. Um, and it's actually the first podcast that was accepted in or invited to be a part of um, Smithsonian's uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is a huge, you know, honor. And he's just been doing this because he's so passionate about the subject matter and was, I think, like just tired of hearing you know, that it's, there's this pipeline problem in tech, right? So he's just gonna continually highlight uh, from a certain community. Um, and I'll just give one more, which is um, Ellen McGirt, which um, she, I'm more newly familiar with her. She writes for Fortune Magazine and um, she does a lot of critical dialogue on uh, race and ability and design and culture, but also physical space. So. She's sometimes talking about architecture and things that I think I can absorb and think about my own translation of it a little bit easier because it doesn't feel like she's talking about me or, or my work, um, but she's just, she's incredibly poignant. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. And, and by the way, we're going we're gonna to list all this out in a, a written form so that uh, folks can uh, see it with links and stuff so we can uh, we can make it useful uh, for someone that uh, is not here on the call but for those who are on the call uh, who've been thinking about their questions uh, I want to open it up and see who has questions for Ashley first ones always takes longer I'll go ahead this is uh, Kate with TIG good afternoon um, question for you Ashley um, do you find, you know, in terms of limited budgets um, and, you know, government certainly can't always um, execute to the extent that, that they would like to on a project, it, you know, in a CXO role, do you feel you play a part in that or what, what role do you think um, design plays in prioritization and what kind of tools do you maybe look at if you're trying to determine, you know, be it ROI or, you know, what kind of, what are your thoughts in, in that? area? Um, I try to be as, as flexible as, part, uh, as possible. So often what our method um, is at and partners now is to, you know, uh, scale, focus on them where we can create some immediate relief um, and then build on that with our clients. And so, you know, just like with any other process, um, it takes a little bit of discovery and you want an initial prototype anyway. So we found ourselves, um, really building that into our proposals more too, when we know that there's a limited budget, just saying, okay, we're gonna start with this. We could even set in to our initial deliverable, um, a metric or goal for success that could, you know, if you need revenue, could contribute to that <laughs> potentially, depend, really depends on the um, specific client here, but like can contribute to revenue. And then once you hit that benchmark, you'll have funds to, be able to invest in developing it further. Um, so we'll build that into the process sometimes. Um, the other thing I think uh, that's been helpful is, you know, we're in partners, so we think about things in partnership with others, but there are times where if you think about it alone, you feel like you've <laughs> um, got to build something from scratch and so the costs go much higher. When you know your limitations, I, and maybe this is like a benefit of being a designer, we work really well with restrictions and limitations, briefs, um, and so you get accustomed to getting something that's really refined and trying to work within that. Um, but when you know those refinements in advance that um, there's really a lot of restriction around budget, um, we can also find creative partners to kind of offset where we would usually build X tool um, we actually think there's an opportunity for this public's, you know, sector, um, 
you know, corporation who does this work because they want to actually be a deeper part of this community and show the value of their product to, um, you know, um, award or partner in and, and join in building something. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but gives you a sense of at least some of the thinking. Very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Who's next? Yeah, uh, this is uh, Ron Peterson with CC Pace. Uh, Ashley, uh, very interesting listening to kind of the background stuff at the White House when you were there. I don't know if you overlapped when uh, Michael Hornsby was there, Ben Kim. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I, we did some initial agile training for those guys back when, and I'm wondering when you came in, what was the atmosphere uh, at the executive office of the president? For, what was the appetite for agile when, when you arrived? Um, I'd say it was quite the the push and pull. They're very there are some different areas, right? So being on the political side, there's the group that maintains some of the basic infrastructure for the White House, is, um, and um, Michael certainly contributed to that. Others um, did as well, and there was generally, I think, a, um, an embrace of agile. Sometimes it would shift a little bit, some like hybrid Kanban, agile, like two different methodologies that got tested out over time, um, but generally a desire. I'd say it probably would have been good to have more continued training because people burn out. There isn't like a steady um, group of staff who was there the whole time. So I think some of that would dwindle and we would get people being like, how do I do this? You know, I want to um, do, uh, you know, use a more agile process. Um, but also the push and pull comes because frankly, like, you know, higher ups didn't care about the methodology. Yeah, yeah. And so when it gets to certain projects, it's like, we just need a it done, right? campaign page out next week that does this. And like what you do afterwards is like, frankly, we don't care. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, there, I think there's sometimes some push and pull there because there'd be this, uh, like attempt for those that really fully embraced agile to be like, okay, let's educate this particular client, this policy client on like the need to build things in a more agile way. Um, and I think we learned over time, like that's not necessarily worth it. You're talking about folks who are already working sometimes 16 hour days deep in policy and their consideration is not the technology. This is like a totally separate thing. And so our office and a few others eventually, I think, learned to be a little bit more of the middle folks to say, okay, there's immediate need. How do we get to that? And then how do we separately, like we don't need to involve the program manager from this team in this. How do we separately talk about like, you know, continually improving the experience of this over the next few weeks, <laughs> months, what does maintenance look like? Uh, when do we check in on whether it makes sense to pull um, this down or whether it's a, a forever type of feature. And so those processes ended up happening with a smaller, probably I think a smaller group, but I would say we, I'm not sure we ever did it incredibly well, just given the atmosphere, but there was a, um, certainly a hunger for it in the EOP side and um, we got better at it integrating with like political and non-political folks as time went on. Yeah, thank you. Okay, final question, anyone? Okay, so I, I've got my, uh, my own question actually, uh, the final question of the day. I know, well, based on, you know, your talk today, and of course, I've, I've seen uh, pictures of you and the president, and I, I watched a lot of West Wing, and I know that um, if you work in the White House, he'll just, you know, pop by your desk occasionally. So <laughs> I'm wondering if you could share your favorite presidential story. Hmm. Um, like where I'm in the room with him? Or yeah, of? anything, really. Um, I didn't get to be around him a whole lot. I think, um, let's see. You know, one of my favorite moments being in the in the same room with with him is actually, and nobody invited me, so I'm kind of telling on myself here. But um, you know, we set up the live stream and we got approval. All these, like speaking of red tape, like both, um, you know, with the external folks as well as internally to actually live stream 
um, Hamilton, we came and did a, a performance at the White House of uh, the Broadway show. And, and I feel like most folks are familiar with, <laughs> with Hamilton the music, musical at this point, but um, you know, I was, you know, could not afford and had no time off to go see it. So like we mostly like listened to it in our office and after everything was up and going pretty smoothly, I was like, well, I'm gonna go over there and just kind of sneak into the back of this room and hang out and watch this for a little while because it's here and it's just an incredible opportunity. So I did that with one of my other colleagues, which um, is a wild thing to be able to do to just kind of like walk into a room with the president and his you know, family is like not a very big room. I think it was in the state dining room. Um, but it was also just an incredible moment because I can't listen to uh, a musical like that without really paying attention to the lyrics. And so to stand in the White House, listening to this like optimistic um, building of America kind of language and like, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, give up my shot just kind of um, moment with a president who I so admired um, and so many of the senior staff um, around all kind of in, together in the same room, like feeling the vibe. I like started to cry in the back, just like proud and like amazed at the opportunity of, of being able to be there. And I found myself like gravitating towards the front and I was like, okay, you're, you know, don't get yourself in trouble here. <laughs> Stay in the back. Um, so, so I did, but I think that was one of the more incredible moments, less of a direct connection, but just kind of that overlap of like the space and the history, the particular um, president, the opportunity to be there and to, and to work. And also just kind of the history of this country, how much we've evolved. Um, That's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. Well, and thank you, Ashley, for being here today, uh, for answering our questions and uh, giving this great interview. So, uh, and thank you to our our AGL members for participating. Uh, Watch for this to be posted online. And uh, again, thank you, Ashley. I really appreciate your time today. It was terrific. Thank you all.